Pastor. Hallelujah. Mighty really are the works of his hands. That is a word, and that is the reason why we can call this the summer of hope. But as I dive into my message, I'm sure you're wondering how, how can you call this the summer of hope? How can we see the images on TV and still say that this is the summer of hope? How can we look at the news and still see the numbers of COVID fatalities rising and still declare that this is the summer of hope? How can we look at the riots and continue to see horrible atrocities against people of color, but yet we still declare that this is the summer of hope? I want to explain it to you, but I'm going to explain it to you by telling you what the summer of hope is not. Sometimes if you can understand what it's not, you'll understand what it is. This is not us burying our head in the sand. This is not us ignoring what's happening all around us. This is not us playing Pollyanna. This is not us pretending we don't see. I got to say that one again. This is not us pretending that we don't see. The summer of hope is none of that. The summer of hope is basically this. Here at TFC, we are saying that we will face the facts but we're going to believe the truth. Come on. We're going to face the facts. We don't bury our heads in the sand. We don't pretend that we don't see that crazy is happening, but we will believe the truth. And for us, the truth is the word of God. Y'all, I'm already preaching. What does that mean for us? It means for us when everything is crazy, when everything is confusing, when the world is out of control, the summer of hope for us means that we don't run first to CNN. The summer of hope means that we don't run first to the AJC or the New York Times. Listen, we will listen and even follow the guidelines of the CDC, the guidelines of the World Health Organization, but they are still not our source. The summer Summer of hope means for us that we're going to run to the hills from which our help comes from because our help comes from the Lord. The summer of hope for us means that Christ isn't just one of many ways, that he is the way. Again, we will face the facts, but we're going to believe the truth. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Now listen, this isn't even where my message is, but I just want you to turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 8. It says this. I love it, y'all. It says, we may be hard-pressed. Does that not describe where we are right now? <laughs> we may be hard-pressed, but guess what? We're not crushed. We may be perplexed, but we are not in despair. We may be persecuted. Can I say it one more time? We may be persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We may be struck down but we are not destroyed. That's what the summer of hope means. Y'all, I love it in the message translation. Will you read it with me in the message translation? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. Listen to this. It says, we've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. Listen to this, y'all. It says, we're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. I don't know about you, y'all, but that makes me want to kick off these hills and run around. It said, we have been thrown down, but not broken. Hallelujah. Now, now listen, y'all know here at TFC, we want to keep the integrity of the scripture. We want to stay in line with what the scripture is really talking about. And that scripture is actually referencing persecution for Christ's sake. Not persecution because you didn't show up at your job on time and you got fired. Not persecution because you've been talking crazy and you got some slack. No, persecution for Christ's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's go to verse 7. Let's go up to verse 7. I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified Version. It says this. But we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation. 
in unworthy earthen vessels. Let me give that to you again. We have this precious treasure. What is that precious treasure? The good news about salvation. In unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty. That's you and me. So not so that the grander and surpassing greatness of the power from God, his sufficiency, and not from ourselves. So listen, when you declare... When we at TFC declare that this is the summer of hope, folks are going to look at you like you're crazy. They're going to look at you and say, you don't see what's going on. But we just simply remind them of the good news about salvation. I haven't even gotten to the heart of my message yet, y'all. I'm just trying to make sure you fully grasp what we mean by the summer of hope. So let's keep reading 2 Corinthians verse 13. Let's go to verse 13 in that same chapter. It says this. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. I'm going to say that part again. I believed in God, so I spoke. Let's personalize it. I want you to say, we believe in God, so we speak. Now, don't leave me hanging. I need you to talk back to the screen. Say with me, we believe in God, so we speak. Come on, one more time. We believe in God, so we speak. Listen, we speak wholeness. We speak blessings. We speak better after this. We speak hope. Why? Because we believe in God, so we speak. Keep reading verse 16. I'm still breaking down to you why we're calling this the summer of hope. Listen to verse 16. Listen to this. That is why. <laughs> that is why people ask you, why is your church saying that this is the summer of hope? Verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Verse 17. For our present troubles are small. I know. I know it don't seem small, but I'm just reading you what the scripture says. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and that will last forever. Verse 18. This is where I want you to rest with me. Listen. Listen to verse 18. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Do you have your Bible in front of you? Are you using a paper Bible? Are you using your phone? Are you using your iPad? Whatever you're using. I need you to read this with me again. Listen, can you read it with me? Verse 18. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Can you run with me over to Hebrews 11? Listen to this. What does it say in Hebrews 11? It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, we're going to put those scriptures together. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What am I saying? This is the summer of hope because we are choosing to fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. That is why we still have hope. Listen, Transformers, do y'all remember I preached a message about faith when we were still able to be in person and I was still able to hug y'all and we were still able to hang out after service. We were able to eat our crisp. Y'all remember that way back in the day? I taught a message on, on faith and I used a visual and I'm kind of using a similar visual. I want you to see this as hope. Now listen, based on Hebrews, we just heard that we fill our hope up with faith. This is hope. This has to get filled up with faith. That's the reason I can't keep my gaze on what's going on all around me. I have to acknowledge it because it would be foolish not to acknowledge it, but I can't become obsessed with it because I got to shift my gaze from what I see and shift it to what I don't see. That means I got to keep my faith up. And my hope 
has to be filled up with my faith. Listen, I'm in my message now because I want you to really understand this. The le- You're not going to ever look at a pillowcase the same. The pillowcase in your bedroom, every time you see it, I want you to think about your faith and your hope. The level, listen to this, the level of your faith directly impacts the level of your hope. If you just have a little faith, it will only, this will only get filled up just a little bit. If you only have a little faith, this will put the faith in here. This will only get filled up a little bit. If you have a lot of faith, this will be fully filled. The level of your faith impacts your hope. If you want more hope, you got to increase your faith. Come on, y'all. I don't want you to take my word for it. Look at Hebrews again. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means your faith is what your hope is made of. So if you have a lot of substance, faith, then you'll have a lot of hope. (laughs) If you just have a little substance, faith, then you'll just have a little hope. Y'all, I'm so excited. I can't contain myself because this is what I know. If you can really grasp this, the rest of your summer is going to be different. If you can really grasp this, the remainder of 2020 will be different. If you can really grasp this, you'll understand why Pastor Lee in January declared that this is the year of our clear transformation. Listen, let's remember our definition of hope. Remember how we are defining hope. For this series, we are saying that hope is an expectation. Did you write it down in your notes? I know y'all are keeping notes through this series. Hope is an expectation of a favorable outcome. It's the expectation of a favorable outcome. But listen to this. Not just a random expectation. It's the expectation of a favorable outcome based on what God has said. So your hope, remember, your hope is filled up with your faith. But I need you to hear me on this. Listen, this is important. I need you to lean into the screen. But faith is not where the power resides. (laughs) I know you're like, wait a minute, Robin, you just told me that my hope has to be filled up with my faith. But listen, faith is not where the power resides. It's where your faith is placed that will determine if there is any true power. (laughs) If your faith is in you, you in trouble. If your faith is in your job, that's a problem. If your faith is in what the government is going to do, come on now, you know that that is a problem. Faith is not where the power resides. The power resides in where you place your faith. Come on. So again, our hope is filled up with our expectation of a favorable outcome based on what God has said. So you know where I'm going to go next, right? You know eventually I'm going to get here because you got to know what God has said. If I'm telling you that your hope is filled up with an expectation of a favorable outcome, not randomly, but based on what God has said, you got to know what he said. But before I go there, let's turn to a familiar scripture. Let's turn to a familiar scripture, John 11. John 11, listen. You know the story, and I don't even want to assume you do. If you are new to faith and you don't know the story, I want you to go to John 11, and I want you to study that chapter. But just for time, I'm going to give you a summary. Jesus is traveling with his disciples, and he gets word that his friend, his friend Lazarus is sick. When he finds out, John 11 verse 4, he says this, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. This is Jesus' words. This sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Verse 5 says, So although Jesus loved Martha, the sister Mary, the other sister, and Lazarus, verse 6 says, He stayed where he was. I got to spend some time right there real quick. Have you ever been going through? I mean, going through it. 
And it sure felt like God stayed where he was. Well, you got a point here. Go to verse 6 of John 11. So keep reading. We're going to go all the way down to verse 32. But please, in your own time, I really want you to study this because it's so good. But verse 32, now keep in mind at this point, Lazarus has died. But Jesus said in verse 4, this sickness would not end in death. Verse 32, read this with me. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Verse 34, where have you put him? He asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? I'm going to pause here because we keep talking about this is the summer of hope. And if you declare that to anybody around you, they're going to say, oh, well, your God don't see all that's going on. You said your God did this. Your your God can't do nothing. Listen, I'm going to talk about what's going on in my own house. Our children are saying, now, wait a minute, mama. Wait a minute, daddy. Why is God letting all of this happen? Let's keep reading. We're going to find out. Verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Verse 39. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. She protested. (laughs) She said, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Oh, do y'all see where I'm going? In verse 4, Jesus told them this is not going to end in death. So they had a reason to hope for a favorable outcome. Not just because, not randomly, not just because they were pulling stuff out of the sky. They had reason to hope for a favorable outcome based on what Jesus said. But when the circumstances got crazy, they, they clearly forgot what he had spoken Listen, some scholars say that, yes, Jesus loved Lazarus, and that's why he was weeping. But others say he was angry because they did not believe what he said. Let's read 38 again. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. Verse 39, roll the stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Oh, I got to make a confession because that very well could have been me. In the midst of God trying to perform a miracle, in the midst of God trying to blow my mind, in the midst of God trying to do something to bless me, because it doesn't make sense to me, because it doesn't go with my rationale, because one plus one doesn't equal two, because he didn't do it the way I thought it should be done, I very well could be Martha. I could protest in the middle of my miracle. She said, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Lord, I don't have enough experience for that opportunity. Lord, I don't have enough resources to make that happen. Lord, I don't have enough money for that. Lord, I don't have the connections for that next level. Lord, I can't forgive them again. Lord, my marriage can't be restored. Lord, my body can't be healed. She said, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell would be terrible. But Jesus said, didn't I tell you? (laughs) That's what he's telling us. Didn't I tell you you would see the glory of God if you believe? Can I remind you of what I said earlier? The bigness of your hope is directly linked to the bigness of your faith, what you believe. Martha was about to miss out on a miracle because she did not believe what he said. Oh my God. I want to finish that story. Verse 41. So they roll the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. 
And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Y'all, I'm just about done. But I have a question. In this summer of hope, where is God asking you to remove the stone? Listen, y'all, let me tell you what's so good about this. He didn't remove the stone for them, although you know he could have. But we serve such a good God. We serve such a gracious God. We serve such a forgiving God. Despite his disappointment, he gave them another opportunity. They had already demonstrated their doubt. So now it was time for them to demonstrate their faith. He told them to remove the stone, and they did. Where is God asking you to remove the stone? What area of your life are you struggling to find some hope? Where is God asking you to remove the stone? Verse 39 said, roll the stone away and listen. The only way you can truly have hope for a favorable outcome when you roll the stone away is because you know what he said. Jesus told them all the way back in verse 4, this ain't going to end in death. Now remember, I laid the foundation. You can't base your hope on what you see. They saw death. They saw it. And guess what? They believed death. Instead of believing what he said, despite what they saw. They believed death instead of believing what he said, despite what they saw. Some things, y'all, I want to be careful here because some things you are trying to roll the stone away and God ain't told you to. He didn't give you a word about that situation. He might want you to leave that alone. That might need to stay right where it is, but there is somewhere in your life that he's giving you a word and he's saying, roll the stone away. Oh, y'all, I got to close. But I want you to remember our definition of hope. Our hope is filled up with our expectation of a favorable outcome based on what God has said. Your faith has to be in knowing what he has said. Once you know what he has said, you can walk with your shoulders back. You can see all that's going on around you and not be shook up. You can be hard pressed, but not destroyed. You can speak hope, not because you are ignoring the realities. You can speak hope because your faith rests in the power of God. <laughs> Many years ago, um, when I first came to Atlanta, I eventually ended up working for the church that I joined my handsome husband and I, he was my boyfriend then, and then reeled him on in. He put a ring on it, but that's another story. Many years ago, I worked at uh, the church that we joined, and I was eventually one of the assistants to the senior pastor. May he rest in peace. And one of the things that would happen when we worked with him, when I worked with him, he was pulled in so many directions, y'all. He had so much going on. Sometimes he would agree to do something, then forget that he had agreed to it. And so our team came up with a form. And so whenever he would agree to do something, whether it was agree to preach at a church or maybe attend an event, whenever he would agree to do something, I would write it on the form. Then I would hand him the form and I would have him sign it. So whenever he would say, I don't remember saying I was going to do that, I would kindly pull out the form and I would say, but sir, you signed your name. And once he saw his signature, he knew his name was on the line. So he would get on up and do what he agreed to do. Listen, as we continue in the summer of hope, you need to spend some time in the word. You got to figure out what God has said, not just generally, but what he has said to you. Where has he told you to roll the stone away? Because once you get clear on that, you will understand that his name is now on the line. If he said it, he is going to do it. So every time you start to doubt, every time you start to question, I need you to say out loud, wait a minute. 
but he signed his name. I don't have to be afraid because he told me that greater is in me that is in them because he signed his name. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Why? Because he signed his name. No pestilence is going to come near my dwelling. Why? Because he signed his name. The weapons may form. They're not going to prosper. He signed. He says he will go with me wherever I go. He signed his name. I'm the head, not the tail. He signed his name. I am blessed and highly favored. He signed his name. Listen, listen to me. If God hasn't given you a word, I don't want you making one up. That's how you get frustrated in your faith. That's how the enemy creeps in. That's when doubt really sets in. Your hope cannot be built on your opinion. Your hope cannot be built on your ways. Your hope cannot be built on your agenda. Your hope has to be built on what he has said. So how do you figure it out? You draw close to him. You pursue his heart, not his hand. You ask him to speak, and I'm telling you, he will. And when he does, when he points to that stone, I need you to roll it away. Why? Because if he said it, he signed his name. We still have hope because our faith is fixed to the rock. And that rock is Jesus Christ. We believe that we shall have a favorable outcome because he signed his name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you haven't accepted Christ, it would be our honor to introduce you to the one who signed his name. It would be our pleasure to introduce you to Jesus. So all you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that he died on the cross, that he is God's son, and that he got up again. And if you make that confession, can you just type in the comment section, confession? Can you just go to our website and say, I confessed, and we would love to walk with you. If you have a prayer request, if you don't have a church home, we would love to connect with you. Just again, go right to our website. I want to pray, and then it'll be time for Children's Church, but I want you to understand how you can walk boldly, how you can still have hope despite what's going on on the news right now is because he signed his name. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you signed your name that your word is the living truth, that we can turn to it to get answers even to what's happening right now, that you have a customized word just for me, just for Lee, just for the pastors and the elders, and not just them, for every person who's listening, you have a word for us. And so God, I'm asking you right now on behalf of everyone listening to this prayer, will you speak so clearly that they know it is you? Show them the stone that you want them to roll away. Give them the courage to be able to do what it is you have said. And then let them be a testament to others who are watching them. God, we thank you and we honor you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for Children's Church. Pastor Lisa is up next. and 